Welcome to Real Life Renos, the podcast. I'm your host, Karen Brown. And for those who are new to our podcast, I'm an aging in place and accessibility strategist. So our podcast examines the physical spaces we live, work, and play in, as well as how we think about our life and progress through it. Today, I'd like to welcome a longtime friend of the podcast, Ron Wickman. And he is a, an architect practicing out of Edmonton and specializing in barrier-free design. Sure. Joining us also is is John Kapchenko, who is a contractor also in the Edmonton area who works with Ron. He's been in the contracting business for about 15 years and focused on accessible building for about eight of those years. Welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. Thanks. It's good to be here. John, let's start with you. Could you tell us what led to your interest in learning more about building for accessibility? Sure. Um, I guess it really began long ago when my next-door neighbor... Uh, his father was in a wheelchair and he was like a second father to me. And so we sort of dealt with all of these issues uh, a long time ago. And it became apparent that there was a challenge. Then my parents aged and and uh, went through the accessibility issues as my mother went, required a walker and all of the different things. And very quickly you recognize that the world we live in is is not ready for the aging of the populations. And so you were able to use your skill set and apply them there. How did you learn about accessible design? Was it like a hit and miss? Did you take courses? What did you do? Yeah, a lot of it was hit and miss. I think we did and redid a lot of things trying to get it right. And um, because it's not as simple as it seems when you say to someone, well, just build your entrance with zero step. It's not easy. The concept is is very simple to say, but it's not simple to line your deck up with your threshold with your inside floor so that there is actually a zero step entrance right so big picture question for both of you over your careers how have you seen the knowledge and understanding of building for accessibility change and and john may have touched on one of the drivers for that change at the aging population but what have other drivers been that have changed our thinking well i i can i can take that on too I would say overall, the the uh, the driver of change over time has been a general increase in public awareness throughout the course of my life, which is 59 years. Uh, my father was was uh, injured in a in a work related accident uh, when I was only three months old. So I've been around it my whole life, and and so I've I've seen the the awareness I- increase, you know, quite substantially from from when I was when I was younger. Uh, and and that's been that's been the driver of a lot of the change, but um, the because of that because it's relied so much on public awareness uh, to drive the change, uh, it's been a slow growth uh, where builders have kind of stayed out of stayed out of the the mix until they're waiting for there to be so much demand for this accessible housing that that then they'll they'll get more involved because then they can see a kind of a, they can wrap a business model around the desire to create more accessible housing. And John, could you talk about what you have seen over the years a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, what I've, what I've seen is very similar to what Ron uh, expressed, but I'm in a different place on the, the sort of food chain of sorts where people are starting to have more immediate impacts on their life. So they're looking for solutions and options to, you know, what was a normal thing like walking out your back door and you can no longer do. You can't right. get out on your deck because you have to cross a threshold. So I think the drivers that I'm seeing are a little more at the bottom or at the, I guess, at the top, really, of where people's needs are. So the the big difference for me as as a contractor is I'm seeing people uh, asking for for different things that than they did say ten years ago, and because they have different needs based on where they are in their life. Right, and and I think adjacent to that, what I'm seeing in my clients is people who have lived in their homes in their communities for. 30, 40 years, and they just, they don't want to move. They can't afford to move yeah. either. So they feel stuck between a rock and a hard place. How, how do I deal with this place that I don't want to leave in this community that I'm familiar with? So for me, that's what I'm seeing. 
Yeah, I would agree. I think there's a lot of comfort in staying in your home. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think if I can, if I can add to this too, I just thinking about the, the, what we're talking about. Um, I, I, when I, when I talk about the, the, the generally public awareness, there is more public awareness. Um, I would say that that's also at, at a, a higher level. So as you know, John was saying, he's, he's often dealing with clients very directly. Like they're all of a sudden their life has been rocked by something, um, somebody in the family's had a stroke or, you know, something's happened and they're just having trouble dealing with the house that they're in. So a lot of times John would be asked to, to look at a very, very specific problem or very specific issue with a very specific house. And where I'm seeing um, change is more at that higher level where people are just aware that there's even this concept of aging in place or uh, visitability uh, you know, I grew up in a visitable house starting in 1967, but the term visitability didn't become a term until the, the, the mid 80s. So I was living in a visitable house. I just didn't know what the word was. And aging in places is, is something that people are just starting to gain an understanding of, or at least they're, they're understanding that, that that's, that's a concept. And it really became apparent when, when our pandemic hit and, and all of a sudden, our, our long-term healthcare facilities weren't doing a very good job of protecting uh, the residents. So now people want to stay at home, and they're they're asking for this this uh, this I or they're asking for uh, solutions that they can age in place. So just to kind of I know we'll be talking about this more, but I think the lack of awareness right now is people don't know how to get it done. So they. They know conceptually. I need. I don't need. I don't want steps. I. I might need an elevator. I might need a, 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 a bathroom that can accommodate me in a wheelchair. But I don't know how to get it done. Right. So not everybody will be able to afford an architect, but most people will be able or, or will default to having a contractor come because that's the person who has the skill set that they need. But when people do have the ability to engage both an architect and a contractor, it's a very important relationship. So let's talk for a minute about the importance of that and who chooses these professionals and puts them together um, and how clients can best engage with both of these professionals so that everybody reaches the same end vision that was had to start with. Yeah, I, I think, you know, a lot of it, again, it, it, it comes from the the clients need, they realize they have this. So then, you know, the, a lot of them will start at Home Depot and say, you know, hey, what can I do here? And of course, there's no help there. And so, um, you know, they, they, they will trend towards medical supply shops, sort of any place where they think they might find some sort of a solution. And then I think, you know, for, for Ron, um, he'd, he'd have to speak to it. But you know, a lot of the work that, that I currently do is through WCB and Ron. So he says, hey, I've, you know, they come to him through whatever, whether it's the Handicap Housing Society or the Senior Center or different things. And, and they, they sort of find Ron that way and Ron uh, engages me. That's really wonderful to have a contractor that you know is available to you and understands the way that you work. It's gold. It, yeah, it is, and you know that's been the hardest, the hardest thing for me as as the designer, the architect, is um, working with the contractor. So, uh, you know, uh, for many many years, I was uh, it would be like a, a one arc, one um, contractor at a time. So it was like having to teach them all over again, and and. Um, you know, things that just seem so simple to me, but I've been doing it for such a long time. It isn't always so simple. Uh, and I realized that. Um, and so once I, once I found, um, and, and started working more with John, he can take what I'm saying and designing and turn it into, into something even better than I, I, you know, I thought could be. So he, he becomes another part of the team where we're together, we're much stronger than we are separately. Right. And so how are people finding you? Is it also through WCB or 
uh, other kinds of organizations? Finding myself? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah <laughs> well, they do. <laughs> it's it's uh, thirty some years of being the only person here in you know Alberta, literally, <laughs> that does this work, and and um, uh, you know I I didn't I, it wasn't strategic. Let's put it that way. I didn't have this business model that I said I'm going to like have a monopoly on this. I don't want a monopoly on it. Um, I I purely got into architecture because of my experiences growing up with my my father. And, and the fact that he was also an activist and and, uh, and somebody that was pushing to have a better built environment. So I, I was just around it. I grew up around it and I, I thought I could, I could be helpful as, as, as the architect. Um, but yeah, now it's just, it, people go, I don't know where to go. And every time I talk to somebody, they say, well, talk to Ron Wickman. <laughs> and, uh, right. and, and, uh, you know, again, it's, um, it's anything from, I want to, I want to sue my condo association because they won't let me make my patio door accessible. I'm, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know how to do that. Um, to, to where can I find a ceiling lift to, you know, where's the best place to go get wheelchairs. And, and so, you know, suddenly I've become like the, the, the person that is supposed to know everything about accessibility. And it's a, big subject matter right so Huge. i i need to also establish a bit of a network where um you know in an ideal world uh and this is what's happening with john is yeah. on on especially on like s- smaller jobs let's say um you know somewhere in that hundred thousand dollar or less range it's very easy now for me to uh, make that initial contact with the client and then just say you're in good hands with John. You don't you don't need me anymore. And and I know it's going to be in good hands because he's going to get it done. And you know if there's any problems, he knows where to come to um, bounce some ideas around. But that's you, you know that's that's what I've been looking for for thirty thirty some years, right? And 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 suddenly um, that happened um, working with John. And John, I I would imagine to a lesser extent. People contact you, and then you contact Ron. But you must sometimes feel that his his skill set would be useful. Yeah, I think what happens actually is, um, you know, uh, for example, uh, I'll get engaged to say build a house, and I'll say to them, you know, have you have you considered the you know the the aging in place repercussions of the design you've chosen, and you know we can engage, you know, someone like Ron to actually make this a reality right and so even um some of the work i do is out on a first nation and you know i introduced ron to a client out there who has a a daughter who required a you know an accessible home and they the the contractor's version of accessibility was very different than ron's so i think ron adds a component of of future or or i guess uh, i'll say foresight so ron looks at the picture of your home in terms of what will it be like 20 years from now whereas most people contractors look at it as in what's going to fit you today right and, and so, that is actually something i wanted to to talk about because i spend a lot of time talking to people who are in their 40s they've had their house for 15 or 20 years they have to renovate something, kitchen or a bathroom. And I'm like, if you're going to live in this house forever, you might want to think about doing it this way. So I definitely wanted to talk with the two of you about whether you have those discussions with clients. And, and John, you're saying that you do. It's tough, yeah, for sure, it, because... it's tough to make them th- see it. Well, and, and the, 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 the reality, I think, um, honestly, Karen, is that it is more expensive to, to plan long term it's more expensive today. Over the over the 25 years you might be in your home, it won't be more expensive, but it is more expensive today. And we're all under the, you know, we all we all have financial constraints of different kinds and and so sometimes people make decisions because it just costs less, right? In the short term. Yeah. Yes, short term exactly. Right. Yeah. Um you, for instance, one of the discussions I have quite frequently has to do with showers. You know, if if, yes. if they're renovating the shower, let's do a roll-in shower. Well, what's that? And, you know, they don't know. 
Euro shower, roll in shower, walk in shower. I mean, call it whatever you want, but if the design seems a little odd to them, then they're not sure that they want to do that, but they they need to actually be sold on the benefits that it could bring to them when they're in their 60s or 70s or 80s or suffer from sciatica or break something, you know, it there's so much and they they just don't want to see themselves as elderly. Yeah, and I think I think in addition, you know, a lot of people they like to do what's safe. Right. And it's safe to go to Home Depot and buy a shower with a curb and put it in. Right. And you know, it's but you know that that whole roll-in concept, you know, people go, "Well, what if my bathroom floods?" Well, if you build it right, it won't flood. And yep. you know, all of those things. So there's there's that sort of fear of the unknown. I usually show them pictures from my travels in Europe. I, I have family and friends in Europe. So I go there on a fairly regular basis. And the next time I go, I'm going to take a lot more of these pictures. But I have been taking pictures of the bathrooms over there. And when I can show yeah. them that, that it's a Euro shower, then they think that's really hot. You know, that's that, that puts it in a different light. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I'll, I'll, I'll use that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah. I think North yeah, America is the really only hard. North America is the only place that doesn't tend to build showers that way. I mean, and Ron and I have talked about this in previous podcasts. In Asia, it's the wet rooms, but in Europe and in in a lot of South America, it's this Euro shower concept, the the roll in curbless type of shower. Yeah, I agree. I think I think you know. Again, it's I don't know exactly why. Uh, you know, Ron and I have this conversation about you know, the, the building codes and the different things that sort of dictate some of, some of that stuff. And, and, you know, I think part of Ron's mission and not to speak for Ron, but is to try and get some appropriate changes higher up um, so that everybody understands it's fine to do that, you know, roll in shower and it's not a hazard and it's not a stress, even though that isn't the standard design that, you know, that that the city would tell you they want. Right. Ron, how do you approach these conversations with people? And I'm, I guess here we're not necessarily uh-uh. talking about people with disabilities, although there are some disabilities that progress and, you know, 20 years from now it'll look different than it does now. But when you're talking with somebody about aging in place, how do you approach those conversations with them? You know, a lot of, uh, like at this point in my life too, uh, in my career, uh, a lot of people approach me already with some pretty good background knowledge. And so the conversation today with, with uh, clients is quite a bit different than it was, let's say, you know, 25, 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's certainly a, a plus for me because I, I, I don't feel I have to educate as much. But having said that, John mentioned that, uh, that we do some work. Uh, I, do, I do quite a bit of work with the Workers' Compensation Board here in Alberta. And uh, we're talking about people that have been injured on, in a work-related accident. And it's probably the whole idea of being in a wheelchair or having a disability is completely foreign to them. So there's a lot of education that goes on there. What definitely helps those clients is that I can speak to it from experience, right? So I can say, hey, my, my dad was actually hurt on the job and he, he was paraplegic and he used a wheelchair. So that certainly gives people a, a real degree of comfort in what uh, in knowing that what I say is is probably pretty good pretty right. good information for them so so it, it I mean I'm trying to educate people at all you know all levels so uh, the the general public uh, policy as John mentioned is huge trying to get the politicians to to weigh in and, and, and understand the concept. And, and as I, at the last three years, especially as I've been really, th- you know, thinking this through, um, one thing that I think is, is really important uh, for our listeners is that um, we all have to, we all have to understand that for, for something like this to really move forward, um, there needs to be a critical mass of people that understand the issues around accessibility, like truly understand the issues and that's what's missing right now. So, you know, you talk to politicians and, they, and they'll say, yeah, I, I mean, this aging in place, that's like, that makes good sense. Visitability, those are, those are great ideas. They're not much money. 
even in the beginning, maybe a little bit more, um, they love it, but they don't, that's where it stops, right? Because they, then they go, well, what is that exactly? Like, how do we make that happen? And, uh, you know, as, as sort of the sole architect that's really pushing this, um, it's too daunting. I can't, I can't educate everybody. John's one of the only contractors that really pushes the envelope as well. Um, you, you can't do everything, right? And so, so we really, we really need to get to that point. And I, I'll say that, that, you know, that's kind of happened in the world of, of our climate change and sustainability. Um, we have gotten to a, a critical mass of people, you know, worldwide that understand that this is a really a big issue. Um, but more people can talk about it. Even the media, they can report on it with some authority now because they understand what they're actually reporting on. Whereas, you know, most reporters I talk to, they, I have to educate them as well. Like they're just asking me, well, tell me what this is all about rather than us having like a real good, you know, conversation about it. Right. Well, you two envelope pushers are working together on a project right now. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, it's, it's an interesting story. And, and I guess just to be completely transparent here, John mentioned that he grew up next door to a family where the dad was in a wheelchair. Uh, that was my dad. <laughs> so, oh, really? <laughs> so, you two were neighbors. Child, oh, there me, are, there are me, stories. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's another podcast. Um, we, we, yeah, we met when we were two. Two and and um, and uh, John has moved out of the the family home many many years ago, and uh, my mom still lives in the home that I grew up in. And uh, uh, last year, maybe the year before, even um, yeah. uh, the neighbor uh, approached me and said, uh, "Your mom says that you're an architect. Do you do infill housing?" And I said, "Yes, I do." And she said, oh, I, I really want to do, um, I want to tear my house down and build something new, like a new two-story home. I'm impressed that she knew the term infill. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, she did. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> and, and, uh, mm-hmm. and, and then I, you know, right away I said, well, I, I uh, you know, to be really upfront with you, I'm, I'm not terribly interested in, like, I like infill housing. I, I mean, that's something I really want to do more of. But I do have this particular stance um, that you, as a client, I want you to take this issue of accessibility seriously and, you know, aging in place and, uh, and also uh, anything to do with green, green design, green architecture, sustainable design. So, you know, I like the idea of energy efficiency and, and all the rest. And she, she really gravitated to both of those issues. She said, well, what do you think about living walls? And I said, yeah, that would be That'd be great. In Edmonton, it's a little trickier than, let's say, Vancouver. But uh, so we've, you know, we've we've started this adventure of of building this house that would allow vegetation to grow all over it. Um, but she really embraced the idea of of this house being a kind of forever home for her and her uh, two young children and her husband. And uh, they embraced the idea of having an elevator and uh, a residential elevator and uh, the curbless shower areas and the no step entrances. And, uh, and that's, that's also when I mentioned that, you know, I'm working with a contractor that I know and trust and, and think would be, be the right person for you to, to work with. So, so she was then introduced to, to John. And so right from the, right from the get go, uh, the three of us, mostly, um, her and myself, the three of us, uh, right from the design stage, And, and, and I was more heavily involved during that design stage. And then of course, John's been more, more involved during the construction stage. But, you know, again, for another, for another podcast, John could tell you all about the fact that he was able to tear the house down that he, (laughs) he grew up in (laughs) and, and, uh, you know, build something new. Um, But uh, one, one thing I'll say that's interesting is, you know, you've got my, my mom's house, which is completely wheelchair accessible but kind of a 1967 version of accessibility. There's a house across the street that uh, was uh, modified to accommodate a, a lady who has MS. And, and now there's this new house that is, is kind of the, um, the shining example of what aging in place is all about and what a really good infill house is all about. So it's, it's, it's a, 
I think it's a good design. I, I, it looks nice. It fits nicely in with the neighborhood. It's, uh, it's accessible. It's sustainable. It really is a, a great example of, of what, what, uh, what good infill housing is all, and just generally what good housing is all about. And we're just in the, you know, the kind of final stages. The family's moved in, um, but we still have uh, lots of work to do with landscaping and so on. And uh, uh, the nice thing, too, um, not to make this story too long, but the, the great thing is that the, my mom loves the, the neighbors. And so they've opened each other's yards up uh, and we're going to do the landscape so that it uh, sort of ties into look like one nice landscaped plan, not two separate ones. That's nice. Mm-hmm. John, what are you going to tell us about living next door to Ron? No, I'm, I'm not going to get you to go there, but do you want to talk about this project a little bit? Sure. Um, I, I think it was, it was really, you know, the, the initial concept of, oh my gosh, I have to knock down the home I grew up in was a little bit different. But then I thought, well, it's going to get knocked down anyway, so it might as well be me. And, you know, we were, Ron and I were, able to retrieve some of the copper piping in there and we're going to use it at Ron's house for, for an eaves trough and some of these different things. And so it was really, it was, it was, uh, it was kind of a really neat experience actually. I don't know if you, when you move away from the home that you grew up in and you go back, it's, it's small in the hallway. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just not what you remember. And so once you walk through there, you went, yeah, this is kind of a crappy old house. And um, <laughs> well, you're also many decades removed from it at that point. <laughs> That's true. I, I mean, you know, God, God bless my parents. I'm sure they wouldn't have thought that. But anyway, and and so the but the idea of being able to take my old home and make it into something that's cool that this lady can age in place in and her family will enjoy was really was really exciting. And so. Um, but you know, you, you run into things when you're doing the infill, like the inverts for the sewer, right? They're not really low enough. They're not low enough to really allow you to, to, or to, I'll say to make it easy to do a zero step entry house. And so you start to run into all of these issues in the infill areas that, um, you know, you can see that, that like Ron was talking, the politicians aren't thinking about, you know, this aging in place in advance. But, you know, conceptually now when I go there, I, it's, it's so cool to see what was my old house that's now this beautiful new home and it's energy efficient and there's going to be solar panels on it and there's an elevator. Instead of having this sort of kludgy walkway with all these stairs along the way, it's a nice ramp that leads up to the front door and, you know, all of these things are so different and you go inside and the, the showers are all roll in with, with hidden trench drains. So it doesn't even look like there's a drain. So a lot of people come in and they go, there's no drain in the shower. <laughs> and, you know, but it's all, it's all hidden. Right. And so, there, you know, just all of these, these things. And when you walk in like Ron Express, the flow is really good. You can roll under the sink, you can roll under the, the cooktop. And it's, it's just a really good example of, of what can be done with a home. Fantastic. Well, we're going to have to do another podcast with some pretty solid video when it's all finished, don't you think? We'll have, have to have a look at that and show people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one, one of the things I was thinking about, too, that, you know, again, we can show uh, hopefully, you know, late spring, early, early summer next year, uh, already... Uh, Interestingly enough, because this doesn't happen a lot in Edmonton with infill, uh, it's actually brought a lot of the neighbors together. Um, uh, a lot of times infill housing creates a lot of tension because um, uh, there's just, it, it's, infill is a good concept until it happens right beside you. Right. <laughs> you, you, and then you realize that, you know, it's like annoying because there's this uh, builders all the time at your site and everything. But um, already, you know, the, the, the client, the homeowner, uh, her and her husband, they, they, uh, they want the landscaping to have uh, like a bench right by the public sidewalk. And so a lot of people walk in the neighborhood. There's a green belt j- just right by my mom's house that people walk their dogs and, and so on. And so, 
it's it's going to be a bit of a it already is and it's not you know the house isn't completely done yet and the landscaping is not done but it's already been a bit of a like a hub of gathering for people to to sit and chat and that's what we want to do with the landscaping as well so um the other really important point i want to make which which is what what i'm saying right now is that in my career um accessibility i, I find people or i think people find accessibility sort of a dark subject, uh, uh, something that they don't want to talk about, they don't want to think will ever happen to them. It's not sexy, and right? It's not sexy. No. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, we always say, oh, you know, one day you might be in a wheelchair. Well, people don't want to hear that. You know, one day you're going to be old. Well, people don't want to hear that either. Right. Um, but, you know, the, these are all realities. And so uh, most housing trends uh, um, sell because people – People don't need them. They want them. And we have to create this concept of accessibility that people want, not need. And, and, and we need to put up like a real positive spin on, on how we market the, the issue. Right. And, you know, it just, I think, I think it's safe to say that both John and I, um, this isn't a job to us. This is, this is, this is just part of our lifestyle. And and we 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 think about it all the time. We 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 try to get better at it. We we try to build on our craft and and um, and the fact that you know we're best friends and we get to hang out and and build together. Um, it's just a it's a great lifestyle, right? And it's just a great thing to be able to do. And and um, I I, th- I think that's what that's what people have to start thinking more about is like this is this is not dark and mean spirited stuff. This is, this is really good stuff. That's just going to make your life, you know, so much better and everybody's life so much better. Just, you know, I know we've said this many, many times, but a no step entrance is not just for somebody in a wheelchair. Right. You know, anybody who, who has a, a baby for the first time and starts pushing around a baby carriage understands that, um, life life is a lot better without steps that's right you know so yep. yeah i'm in love with the idea of the bench by the sidewalk it yeah. sort of it harkens back to a time when people did used to sit on their front porches and the neighbors would chat as they passed by but now front porches are so tiny for the most part people don't really sit there and we've moved into our backyards for our our leisure outdoor time so i i really really like that idea let's let's take a just a little bit of a jog and talk about sub trades that's something that is always um something of a concern because sub trades don't receive education to any great extent if at all uh while they're going through college or as they're learning on the job for those first few years, they don't learn at all. And Ron, you made an interesting point to me as well, talking about people who do have disabilities who really can't afford to have architects and designers and official contractors. So they become their own contractors and they have to learn as they go. So let, let's talk a little bit about uh, dealing with sub trades and the education that they have to receive and, and where they need to go in the future. Maybe, maybe I can just start. I, I think John would have more to say about that than me, but I, at, at kind of the, the architect level, what I, what I find is that uh, in general, yeah, the, the trades don't, um, don't know a lot about accessibility and they, they, they kind of know what they know and they're usually really good at what they do. Um, but they're, they're, generally not, uh, let's say, as curious as, uh, as an architect would be or a, a general contractor uh, in the sense that, you know, we're, we're the ones that tend to think about the house as from a big, you know, high level, big picture, um, whereas a, a trade tends to focus more on their particular uh, craft or their particular, their specific issue with the house. And, and so, you know, it is, it takes somebody like John to, to even talk about a door threshold and go, okay, well, we've got the guys doing the concrete on the outside. We've got the guys doing the flooring. We've got the guys doing the framing. We've got the door supplier. Like he's got to coordinate all of those various trades who don't know exactly what we're trying to do. 
Um, so they know what they've done before, which has created um, a, a, a step <laughs> right. at the front entrance. So John's got to, you know, be very savvy and be able to, you know, communicate all that stuff. And, and so it would be incredibly helpful if, if, the learning experience for a sub trade on working in a, on a job like John's old house that he's just recently built uh, for them then to take that to the next job and, you know, maybe talk to the general contractor and go, well, we just did this here and, you know, educate the general contractor. And so it, it does kind of take this kind of community spirit, right? And you, you mentioned about the, the, you know, that idea of the bench at the street, like, People have to, again, I get back to that critical mass, like people have to really, really want to make this happen, want to make the change happen and see the value of it. And um, uh, I, 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 you know, again, I, I could say that in trade schools, there should be more education and that would help the trades. Um, but it's going to, for the most part, it's going to be um, on the job training. Right. John, let's have your input on this. Yeah, I think that the... the you know, I when I think about it optimistically, I would like to think that one day there'll be, you know, a, a section in their training manual that says, you know, accessible design or accessible options for what you do. But today there is no direction of any kind for these people to understand what, well, I, I guess I'd I'll, I'll call it the growing niche of accessibility is, is actually about. And unless somebody asks them to do it, most people aren't incented to even try to do it. So, you know, back to that whole business model, right, where the builders aren't building you a zero-step entry house until until it becomes subsidized or cost-effective or a better way for them to make money. Right. So most divisions in, in Edmonton, for example, because of the uh, design, they need two or three steps to get in. Well, it's not actually the design. It's the fact that the contractor can save, you know, several hundred thousand dollars by not sinking the inverts and the pipes into the subdivision as far. So less dirt work, better profit for them. But the result is the design now requires steps. And so, again, the the whole thing is really, uh, you know, you know, you, that that concept of circle of life. And somewhere along the chain, it has to, it has to start, uh, you know, much like an electric car, it needs to be subsidized to get it started. And I think part of this is going to require some political will that says we need some subsidy to start this. And then when that happens, then I think you'll start to see the education chain change and different things. But for the most part, when I talk to even suppliers and say, I want to put the joists inside the foundation so that we can have a zero step entry they go well we don't we don't do that i know you don't that's why i'm asking you to do it that way and here's here's how you can do it right right and and so you you know that education process needs to start so the 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 sub trade that we use to do for example a roll in shower um the first the first two were man, we spend a lot of time explaining, here's how this has to go. And now I just call them and say, and I need a roll-in shower. And they go, yeah, got it. Right. And so it, it's in and in, in, in of itself, it's not a complicated process, but you have to have the direction and the desire to do it the first time. And then it becomes like everything else, just routine. Now, John, if you are a person with a disability who needs to renovate their house and you're going to be your own contractor, how do you go about finding (laughs) trades that can accommodate your wishes? That's hard. Yeah, it is. And and unfortunately you need to, you know, again, maybe it's part of that whole, you know, there, there needs to be some sort of a recruiting drive or something that, that creates a list or a, you know, a place where you could go to find that information. But really, unfortunately, what what the, you know, that person needs to do is, is be educated enough to ask the questions. And I know that's not easy either. And when I say educated enough, I don't mean in, in overall education, I mean, knowledgeable enough in the actual 
uh, needs of them of their home. And so right. that almost leads you back to Ron, right? Or someone like Ron who can give you that information. Right. They need to have very uncomfortable discussions about things like how they use the bathroom. Yeah. With a a plumber who is going to be equally uncomfortable and still not understand the solutions, right? It's not easy. (laughs) No. And, and, and unfortunately there are things where needs change. Ron and I did a, a really nice successful washroom for a gentleman a couple of years ago and he went in there and when the OT said, you know, I think rather than you transferring because you're getting older, you should use a commode chair. So instead of going from a comfort height toilet, which he could transfer to, we now had to go to a little baby toilet that his commode chair would go over. And so the the, the aging in place process um, isn't, you know, a one and done thing either. Right. Last question for both of you. Over the next five years, if the world were perfect and you were the ruler, what, <laughs> what would you like to see happen in your respective professions with regard to building for accessibility? I mean, in very practical terms. I'll start with that one, yeah. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think there needs to be like a stronger ed- education program that also meets people where they're at. So, you know, I've been part of a lot like Canada Morgan Housing they've created a lot of documentation. So it, it's not that hard to find out about this stuff if you go to their website, for example. They've got a great series called uh, Accessible Housing by Design. It's, it's, I think there's like, let's say 13 chapters. And, you know, I helped, I helped produce that for them. And you, you can go to like a 20-page document that's all about accessible kitchens and then another 20-page document that's all about accessible bathrooms. So, so the the information is there, but it's really hard to sift through. Like, it's really hard for somebody to you know go online and and find this stuff and then like read through it and go, okay, well, you know, again, I understand that a curbless shower can be done, but you know, there's nobody really telling them well how to how do you find the subtrade that can do it and how do you talk to them about it and how do you convince them that it's not so hard to do and. And so you, I, th- I think there needs to be uh, this education or this awareness program. You know, certainly it's something that I've, uh, I've always thought in my career that, uh, you know, eventually as I, you know, I'm just about 60 now. So I, I kind of see that as my role. I've, I've spent a long time learning this and I, and I feel like it's, it's, uh, it's getting to be time that I need to start educating more and and um, it's hard for me to make that change because again there aren't enough contractors like John out there and other architects that allows me to kind of just leave that part of the business you know the const- the design and construction part and just concentrate on education so I'm waiting for that time when I feel like maybe I can you know do that in in the meantime I just I just do as much as I can but it Sure would be nice to have like, you know, a group like Canada Morgan Housing or any any municipality and government to to invest some real dollars into this and create, you know, create programs where, uh, Karen, you're very knowledgeable, you know, like it, if somebody would actually pay you to teach and educate, I, I, the three of us would all be happy to, to do that and bring our bring our knowledge to, to people. But we tend to just volunteer our time on stuff like that. And you have to be, you have to be a bit careful, right. Um, about how much time you, you give to, to things like that. So it, again, it just gets back to um, more and more people need to learn more about this, about the issue of accessibility and, and kind of understand each other's roles in this uh, to be able to talk competently about it. I will post the link to the CMHC uh, document in our podcast notes, because that is actually a good place to start for people who are their own contractors. Right. Then at least they can have some exposure to the concepts and the language to some extent, because even understanding how to talk to your contractor is a different language for many people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. John, John, what would you like to see? Well, I I just to comment to to that last statement, Karen, I I think, you know, for, for better or for worse, um, most people 
choose the path of least resistance. And so when, when you talk to your contractor, it's, I think it's important that you stick to your, to your sort of guns. And, you know, for example, when you say, I want to roll in shower and he says, well, I can get this, uh, shower pan and it's only an inch. So it works. It, it, you know, it's the same and people go, Oh, oh, okay. But it's not the same. Not at all. And he's taking the path of least resistance because it's easiest for him because we're all busy. And so there's, there's a different sort of, uh, the individual has to, has to be able to stay their course in terms of what they need and want. So even, and it's not, this is not a new thing. When Ron designed the house I live in now, 25 years ago, he did some, you know, unique things. And I remember having the conversation with the contractor saying, well, why do you have 36 inch doors? And I said, because I want 36 inch doors. Yeah, but 32 is more than enough. And they're, they're cheaper and easier to put in and what. I understand, but I want 36 inch doors because one day I might need a walker. Oh, well, I know. Come on. Right. So this is just easier and cheaper. And why would you spend, you know, that's what I want. You might want to move a couch in. Yeah. Like some simple things. Right. But, but the, you know, I think again, unfortunately, you know, the economics of, of the world we live in, drives people to take that path of least resistance. And so therefore, one of the key criteria to having a successful, accessible renovation is going to be understanding what you want and then sticking to it, even though they tell you that's not the way it's normally done or that's not normal or that's going to cost more or or whatever. And it does cost more. There's no question about most of that stuff. But the reality is it, it costs more today, but 10 years from now or when you need it, it'll be significantly less to do it once up front. And also I will point out that contractors are excessively busy right now. So, you know, 20 years from now or, or even tomorrow, if you should have something unfortunate happen to you or your disease progresses to a point where you need to make changes in your house, you will probably not find a contractor who can come next week or next month. It, it could be a two-year wait. That's the reality of it, right? Yep, that's right. Right. We don't know. Like the, I, uh, I read an article from one of the CEOs of a fairly significant construction company in Canada, and they estimate that over the next 10 years, 40% of the um, skilled tradespeople will be retiring, and they're currently being replaced at a rate of one. So... Um, you know, it's, you're, you're talking about four and 10 going away and one replacing that person. And we're already so overwhelmed that, you know, 10 years from now, this is going to be significantly worse and the costs you're exactly right will be higher. That's brutal. All right. Any last words from either of you? I, you know, I was just, just thinking about this, this conversation. Um, uh, I, I think when I was probably about well, closing in on 50, so 10 years ago, I, I would say um, I'm not trying to influence anybody older than me. I'm trying to influence people younger than me because they're the, they're the future. And, and it uh, just this sort of dawned on me as, as, as I was listening to you and John talk, we, we do have a real opportunity to, to educate young people about these issues. Um, I think, you know, based on my own kids and, and, and their their circle of friends, there there's there's a greater awareness and sensitivity to to issues around accessibility, and there the, the other thing, as John said too, as as the the old guard is leaving on uh, mass, the young people don't they're not going to get as much on the job training. You're just going to be sort of thrown into the trenches and you have to figure it out for yourself. And I think a lot of young people go to, uh, you know, YouTube videos and other things to figure out how to like solve problems. So, you know, that could be part of the education program as well is like to use social media to, 
um, to educate people and let them know that, you know, these, these aren't really that hard to do. You just have to be aware of them. Right. And so how, how you access information, I guess, is also going to be critical for, for us to know, you know, how, how do young people want to learn and, and where are they going to go to, to learn? And I think the best way is to work with somebody who's, who's done it before, but, as John said, that's, that's not going to be happening as much. Right. And I've certainly noticed that in the, in the industry. So there's got to be other ways to, to kind of train people. Right. John, any last words from you? No, I just think I just, you know, I guess sort of a general comment that I think it's, uh, it's great to be involved in something like this where people have a, you know, an, a resource they can go to, to understand what it may or may not benefit them in terms of getting you know, staying in their home and having future accessibility, right? Right. I think it's, that's really good. And I mean, nobody, nobody really has a crystal ball about how we're going to manage it for the future, but I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that, you know, the forces of our market and world are such that as demand increases, so will attention. And I just, it's unfortunate that, we have to wait for that demand to increase before the the attention is put there. But I am optimistic that one day we'll get there. That's a good note to end on. Well, mm. my thanks to Ron and John for their valuable insights. We are all the better for hearing them. And my thanks to our audience for joining us. And I hope to have you join us again on Real Life Renos, the podcast. Real Life Renos the Podcast is a production of Reno Studios, executive produced by Karen Brown. This is real life theme, music, and lyrics by Jane Carmichael. Recorded at Swamp Songs Recording Studio in Lucan, Ontario. Engineered by Matt Weston. Thank you for tuning in.